Hey, hey, Gator Nation. Welcome back to another fantastic episode of the Respect Our Decision podcast. Guys, as always, I'm your boy, Hirsch. With me, CJ, the man, McCann. What's up, guys? And, of course, the hype man, Wes. What's good, Gator Nation? Yes, sir, Gator Nation. Gator Nation, man, we're going to cover a wide spectrum of sports on tonight's episode. Obviously, spring practice just now getting fired back up. Not a, not a whole lot we can really get from there. You know, obviously, media is only getting a little bit. Uh, we got some hype videos coming out, things like that. So we're getting to see a little bit of this, that, and the other. Um, but so we got our man Ryan's going to be on here just a little bit to join us to talk about the NCAA tournament and what Florida's side of the bracket looks like and what we would have to do to make a run, obviously, with a big injury and things like that coming out of the loss in the in the SEC championship game. And then at the end of the show, CJ's going to do a little round the bases with us and talk about the Florida baseball team. I know there's some concern about – the pitching staff and how the team looks, but CJ is going to going to talk a little bit and try to cool your, cool the flames a little bit, uh, bring, bring the doubters back to earth. There's some guys that may be um, wondering why uh, a bunch of young pitchers are struggling so hard early in the season, but guys, we're going to start off, man. We're going to talk about some recruiting. We got some recruiting to talk about, but before we get to that guys, as always, man, make sure you go out, download where you, uh, the podcast, wherever you get your podcast from. If you are catching us on YouTube, maybe this is your first time coming across the show. Maybe you're a return viewer that hasn't done it yet, guys. Go ahead and drop a subscribe on the channel, please, if you don't mind. It helps us a great deal. And guys, if you like the content, maybe even if you don't like the content, dudes, throw us a favor, man. Drop a like on the video. It helps us a great deal. And leave us a comment down below, guys. What do you think where do you see the Gators getting in the NCAA tournament? Did they, did they make the Elite Eight? Did they get beat by Colorado in the first round? What's going to happen now? Um, leave your comment below of your prediction of what you had. Be honest now. Don't don't change it now. Whatever you put on your bracket, put it in the comments below, guys. I I got us going to the Elite Eight. I did. A, I, I kind of went west on us here. Got a little hype. <laughs> Um, <laughs> even with the injury, I, I still got faith that bracket's not that bracket's open, man. All right. But also, guys, before we get to any of that, thank y'all so much, Gator Nation, for really just killing last week's video, man. As of when we just started this recording, 3.8 thousand views on last week's video on YouTube, guys. That's one of our biggest shows to date and a huge, and I mean an absolute huge thanks to Zach Goodall for coming on with us last week. Uh, make sure y'all go out, check out Zach's content on SI All Gators, man. Zach does a wonderful job, very unbiased takes on, on his Florida Gators takes. And we're going to have him back on again in the in the spring and talk a little bit more about what we think is going to happen with the season. So, guys, let's jump into it, man. Um, you know, with Zach being on the show last week, first and foremost, we, we forgot we had gotten to commit. <laughs> now... A lot of the world may not have even realized we got a commit because the Gators went out and got a commitment. Very, very weird. Wasn't a whole lot of hype to it. It just kind of like the kid just tweeted out, I'm committed to Florida. And Billy Napier put out his little sunglasses and all that. So I guess it's official. Uh, Enoch Wangoy. Yes, that's right. Enoch Wangoy. He's an offensive tackle. He's from um, across the pond. We went, we went overseas again for the offensive line needs and grabbed us another offensive tackle. Um, the kid's located in Jacksonville now at the um, Zarapeth Academy. If you guys, anyone watching the show is near that and knows what that academy is, and if they're big in football, this is a very, this is a new new thing to me. So if any of y'all are watching and you're like, oh, I know exactly where that is, drop it in the comments, man. Let us know. Kind of trying to get some knowledge about where this young man's going to school. But this is a big monster of a kid, man. If you haven't seen the pictures of him, he's 6'8". He's currently around 270. But, you know, he's still got his whole senior year to go. Um, obviously, you can't coach 6'8". Uh, you can't. <laughs> that, <laughs> that kind of size is hard to come by. And if you've seen pictures of the kid, he's every bit of it. He's a huge kid. So, obviously, you see the Gators are making early priority of the offensive line, this being our second offensive line commitment in the class. So... Um, guys, I'm gonna I'm go around real quick. Um, <laughs> what's your take on on the take on the take of Mr. Enoch Wangoy, Wes? Yeah, we we took a kid like this last year. Um, the German, 
Yeah, and I, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, as you can see, as we could continue to allude to, as far as the staff and uh, the type of body types they like, they like big guys. Uh, whether it's from the portal, whether it's recruiting, uh, whether it's going cross country, not cross country, cross <laughs> but, but, but cross <laughs> the water uh, to get those type of guys. They like the big uh, six eight guys and you can see Merch is a, a kind of big kid and so is DJ so uh, uh, it won't hamper them as far as the quarterbacks so um, I'm okay with taking it if the offensive line recruiting overall continues to improve and we uh, just before him we got a uh, interior offensive lineman highly highly recruited uh, and, and ranked as, as far as recruiting rankings are, are, uh, are. so um, I'm okay with it it seems like the, the offensive line uh, we've been on them uh through the portal uh and last year they got a couple guys and and this year uh i just alluded to the 25k we got from out of uh, georgia right um he's pretty uh highly ranked as well so I, i'm liking these projects i don't mind these projects and uh one thing we know uh there's two things people used to say one that you can't teach speed uh the second one is you can't teach size and uh, if, you, if this kid is athletic, I don't know much about him yet. I haven't dug and dove deep into uh, his tape or anything like that. So I can't say anything about that. But if, if the staff is uh, taking a chance on a flyer on a guy like this, that means you have to recoup otherwise with highly ranked guys to, to, to be able to do these type of things. So to me, in recruiting is in, in general, they got to get some more. They start off well with the interior guy. I would like to see another highly top 150 tackle, and then I'll be really, really okay with it, with this pickup. But uh, I'm, I'm not going to be mad about a 6'8 type kid. Uh, and their staff, obviously, they they know something. Uh, we, we were Before we came on, we were talking about baseball and how they – have scouts everywhere. Apparently, this staff has scouts overseas somewhere. But they're getting these type of kids, so um, uh, I, I'm okay with it. CJ, yeah, I've I've mentioned before about like the John Hevesy specials, where he was taking you know project kids that were six six two, maybe two forty, two fifty, and he was going to grow them into great offensive linemen. And that was never a smart plan. You know, these kids could only grow so much more and it didn't work out. At least if we're taking projects, they have uh, great size already as an advantage. And, you know, you're going to have to develop these kids. Um, you know, of course, overseas has made strides in how football is perceived over there. And, you know, they definitely have a lot more football going on in Europe than they did at one point. Um, but if he's got, you know, a great athletic uh, skill set to go with the size. And the only thing you're looking at is you're really going to have to teach him technique um, and understand that. And if that's what they're looking at, then, you know, I don't have a problem with it. Um, like I said, as long as you're not taking guys that, that aren't just aren't the size to play the position and you think you're going to, you know, technique them into being great players without the athleticism, without the size, you know, I don't really have a problem with it. Um, you know, these are kind of maybe, you know, you're looking at a diamond in the rough kind of player. Um, you know, it's early on. You take the kid now. now uh, we've talked about it before where there's a possibility where you get down the road and you need a spot. And it's a lot easier to let go of, you know, certain kids than it is other ones. I'm not saying they're going to do that to this young man, but it's definitely something to keep in the back of your mind. Um, but no, you, you've already gotten an elite prospect on the offensive line, uh, committed in this class. You take this guy, you take a flyer on him, you know, really get him in the program, teach him technique, teach him how to play offensive line, let the rest of his size and his athleticism do the rest. Um, you know, stuff that you really can't teach, um, you know, put the hard work in him. So the talent can, can really work hard for him. Uh, I, I don't have an issue with it. It's it's not going to jump off the page. It's not going to be everybody's favorite thing. But, you know, I say this all the time. You know, we, we people scream about stars. There's only 30, 35 stars in the country. Um, you know, you, you can't expect to get all those guys. You know, you, <laughs> you know the higher-ranked kids, there's just not as many of them. So you, you have to fill in, especially when you're talking offensive line in general. Most of the offensive linemen is, is the hardest position to judge. It was the hardest position to evaluate. So if they found a kid that they think can be ahead, you know, if this kid played in the United States, I think we'd look at him different. 
I think that that wouldn't be an issue. I think if this kid had played, you know, growing up his whole life playing football in, in Georgia or Alabama or something like that, I don't think we'd be even having this conversation of why do we take this kid. So let's see how he develops and see how he grows. Um, early stuff out of, you know, what we've heard about Noel Port Hagen is he's really super athletic. So maybe this guy is going to be in the same kind of vein as just a guy who's got great feet, um, you know, and, and can really – learn some technique and it's not going to look like, you know, a, a bear on roller skates out there. Uh, you know, it's, it's a guy that actually is pretty sure footed and, and can learn the position. Um, You make mention of that. Uh, he hasn't played, you know, playing football very long, how many five stars are. And that, I want to harken back to a couple of cycles ago, pancake. Everybody remembers pancake uh, Samson who went to Miami, but, that was a young man at the time. Yes, he was a five star. He was he was much, you know, well thought of prospect. But at the time, the kid had only played football for like a year and a half. Um, so it's this is a very to me like if this kid he's still got a full, you know, he's got the rest of his of his junior year and then his whole senior year to go. So this kid he puts on some weight. He he plays over here in the U.S. next year. Uh, scouting services obviously are going to watch him a lot closer now, especially with him being committed to Florida already. That will obviously put some some eyes on him that maybe weren't before. This is a kid that if he goes out and, and he looks really good, obviously, like you just said, on American soil now, nothing against them playing football in Europe. I, obviously, I mean, that's becoming a big thing over there. And I like the fact that maybe we're setting a press, you know, precedent here of getting over there and noticing some of these kids, because like you said, you find a couple of diamonds in the rough. And yes, I know there's people, I know some people are going to listen to this and be like, you know, this is all well, fine and well, but you can't polish a turd and all that great stuff that people like to say. You know, I get it. You want five top 200 linemen. I understand that. I absolutely do. You heard, if you've listened to this show for any amount of time, you've heard all three of us at one time or another sit here and say, we need to get higher you know, rated offensive lineman. But, okay, like CJ just said, you add this kid now and he doesn't pan out, well, you've got some wiggle room. you got plenty of time to say, you know what, young man, um, maybe you're better off going to a um, USF or UCF or somewhere like that. We're going to move on to a higher rated prospect. Or the flip side of that is you've got him in the boat and the kid starts to develop at a really high rate, and people are like, "Holy, we missed out on this kid. Let's let's get into this." So you know, it's better to be in the boat than out of the boat <laughs> in some in certain situations. I mean, you just have to look at it like that. All right, guys, let's talk about some visits, man. Obviously, like I said, spring practice kicking back up, uh, and we talked about this for a couple of weeks now. Kids are going to start visiting, and today uh, we got a couple of legacies in town today. Uh, Vernell Brown is in town today visiting vernell brown is is obviously a very highly sought after uh recruit right now i know a lot of people feel like just because he's a legacy he should be in the class and that ain't the case with vernell brown vernell brown has done his homework i think vernell brown wants to be his own man um he's looked high you know at one point miami was looking like they were in a really good spot with him but now ohio state is the team to beat and I don't know what Ohio State's got going on right now, but obviously they're clicking in recruiting big time. They've they've got something figured out as far as that goes. So um, we got a lot of work. I think Vernell Brown's going to be one of those that you're going to have to show him during the season, much like we we talked about with Grimsley last year. He's going to have to see something. Now, obviously, some pieces fell our way with Grimsley, and we ended up with him after all. Uh, Vernell Brown, you're going to have to go out and show him that, you know, things are going good here. He's going to have to get a relationship with Will Harris. There's a lot of ground to be made up with Vernell Brown. We'll just have to see how it goes. Uh, C.J. Ingram, very raw prospect, um, has placed quarterback for his dad's team there in Hawthorne, uh, but he translates to a receiver right now in college. He's six four and a half. He's right around 200 pounds, really big body framed kid, obviously. Uh, his dad knows a thing or two about catching the football and running with it. So currently unranked, but he's one of those kids that's really, really kind of starting to catch a buzz. I think he's one of those that's going to grab a ranking here shortly, and you're going to see him slowly start to, you know, really. You'll have to see how he goes to 
to, to camps and what position they put him at at camps. Um, you know how that kind of stuff works with these camps. We've talked about it over and over and over again. Um, but just the other day, um, uh, oh my gosh, I forgot his name. Ackerman crystal balled him and um, a cornerback that I'm going to talk about here in a second to Florida. Now I know that's not moving a lot of needles. Once again, un unranked kids. I get it. I understand that. The other kid is a is Caleb Singleton, who's a cornerback who's currently ranked like 100, uh, 813 in the composite. And I understand it, guys. I understand that these kinds of kids right now are not going to move the needle as far as what you you would think the University of Florida needs to compete. But also remember, this is early for a lot of kids, and a lot of these kids' rankings will adjust dramatically going into their senior year. So don't take a whole lot of stock into it. Obviously, you know, you still want to see us involved – with the top 50 kids. And, and that's a conversation for a different day, but you know, this thing's starting to work itself out as far as kids were after. And we're just going to have to see where some of these kids shake out in the wash. Um, also other, too, you got to yeah. look at uh, last year early on about the same time we had like crystal balls and projections for like guys like Jarvis spoke, right. And people like yeah. that, that just never, just never came here. That and is a very good ever, point. Like, it wasn't, you know, it just kind of like they got worked out. At one point, we might have been a team that they considered, but you know, this staff is very well. Just hang on a minute, see, if, you know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing our homework. You keep doing yours. So, I mean, again, it's it's March, so we're about to start April. It's still kind of early until we get into the Mays, the Junes, and the Julys. I'm not really going to freak out about early crystal balls because these, again, we saw so many of these come in last year. We're like, Oh my God, we're going to get this three star and this unranked guy. And, da, da, da. and there was and a they, lot of outrage. What, <laughs> right. And, and that none of that ever happened. Those guys were never even really serious uh, considerations for us. So I wouldn't put too, too much stock into this. Maybe, maybe CJ Ingram, because he is a legacy. Um, you know, you can kind of look at it that way and maybe battle rises up the rankings. We've seen us take, you know, low rank three star corners a lot, but they turn into guys that, that kind of trickle their way up by the end of the season. They're like, these guys are pretty good. So if it is one of those guys, I wouldn't I wouldn't freak out about it. Singleton is a kid that was originally offered by Corey Raymond. And then Will Harris watched his tape and watched some stuff on him and then re-offered him. So. There you go on that. He's from Orange Park. So, I mean, this is a guy that obviously they see a lot of – he's 6'1". You know, he's got that that great corner sight frame that you're looking for. So, he – obviously, multiple coaches have seen quality things out of the kid. So, that's one of those guys you keep an eye on. You see what the rankings do. Maybe he, he goes to some camps. Some guys watch him work on some one-on-ones, and they're like, oh, man, this kid's way better than what we have him at now. That's why the rankings right now are kind of a wash. I mean, unless you're a top 25, 50 kid, I mean, obviously some of those guys, you know what they are. I yeah, mean, especially been... when you're talking about defensive back too, because yeah. you, guys all, you guys all know when you're a, you're a freshman, sophomore, junior in high school and you play DB, that means you really play everything. You play a little <laughs> wide receiver. You play a little scat back. You play kick special returns, teams. Yeah. Special teams. Oh, I mean, me. yeah, that, I mean, you know, just – the DBs, the young DBs on teams are just utility guys for their first three years of high school. So it's I about mean, camps and stuff with them as well. Right, yeah. right. They're going to have to camp and they're going to have to see how he camps. And again, it's just so early that he could be a great player. We, we, like I said, we've taken guys like him that were three stars this early on and they turned into good to great players by the end of it. You know, you look at guys like we got now, like Teddy Foster and those guys that we still took. Even though they were three-star players, they progressed. Jakeem Jackson at one point wasn't super highly thought of. He progressed. Yep. You just got to kind of let this stuff work out and not to not not read too much into these rankings until we get like the new ones in the summertime and they they've done some camps and stuff. You you, you really don't know what you're getting into yet. Yeah, and this is going to be a weird season anyway. With, with oh Cooper. yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, there's going to be uh, any, if you're a top kid in the recruiting cycle this year, you're watching Florida and going. I, I I gotta see something. Exactly. I mean, and and I'm sorry, it is what it is because every single other coach recruiting against us is saying, you know, Billy's not gonna be there in November, exactly. right? I mean, they're saying it. They're like, look at his schedule. They're showing they're pulling out our schedule 
to a recruit. Yeah. I guarantee you they're doing it. They're pulling out our schedule and going, you see this? He's going to lose five games in a row, and they're going to fire him. Yeah, you don't want to go there. Exactly. <laughs> so mean, it, it's kind of twofold. It, it's, they they want to uh, – some kids like the celebrities. Some kids like the – uh, look at me, but there's some kids that want to commit to one school and stick with that school. And we all know how people state that not people, but recruits love Billy as far as him being authentic. And I don't think a lot of them want to commit to Billy and then he gets fired and they have to go somewhere else. So uh, you have the kids that want want to be seen, want to be out in front of everything, but you have some kids that want to commit, want to get it over with and say, hey, I'm about to commit to this school and that's it. And I think some of those kids that won't maybe want to commit to us will have a wait and see approach. And you can't blame them. I mean, you just, you really can't. I mean, we, and we have no one to blame but ourselves for creating that situation. I mean, yeah. it is, that is what it is. You win a couple of those games we last year we've talked about so frequently, mm-hmm. and maybe right now you're not even you're not even worried about this conversation. If you're seven and six after last year, or whatever you could have been, right now that conversation is Billy Napier improved from year one to year two. Now at year three, you know, blah blah blah. So, but no, now you're playing from behind the eight ball, and and this is you know you made your bed and you have to sleep in it. So, um, another visit, big uh, big time visit. That's this uh, actually, excuse me. Getting here today and staying through Saturday is running back Marquise Davis out of uh, Ohio. He's a 6'1", running back, 190 pounds, number 172 overall in the composite currently. Um, And right now, obviously, your first thing you hear, running back out of Ohio, I mean, you're fighting against Ohio State. But apparently, right now, Ohio State's not as big on him. He's actually – Kentucky is actually in the lead for this young man now, which, I mean, not too far-fetched there, you you know, just south of Ohio, Kentucky. Um, but this is a kid that's very interested in Florida and how Florida uses its running backs. And he has a tremendous relationship with Coach Jaluk. So he's coming down. I, I think it's crazy to me that at this time of year, he's coming down and spending, you know, three days on campus watching practice. So maybe you make a tremendous impression on the kid. Obviously, Florida's looking for a second running back to take in this class with Waltez Clark. Uh, we've talked about a couple already, but. You know that's that's a great deal to get that kid on campus and for a few bunch of days and then see what comes out of it. Yep. Um, another visit we have for that's coming in tomorrow. This one uh, just kind of popped up earlier today and I saw it. Uh, Caden Strayhorn, who is an interior offensive lineman out of IMG, is coming tomorrow. 6'3", 285 pounds, currently ranked three hundred ninety in the composite. Um, obviously, you know we've talked a lot about. Offensive tackles, offensive tackles. We've taken what seems like an insane amount of offensive tackles the last few years. Um, whether they be, you know, projects or not, I mean, we've taken quite a bit. But now you're starting to see us obviously get in on some more interior offensive linemen. Obviously, you're going to need to see some in this class. We've already got one in the class. Uh, saw him on, on on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it, earlier re- recruiting Caden Strayhorn, he was saying, you know, I think it's about time to make this official. Um, really like what I'm seeing so far and the sense of urgency that I'm seeing out of uh, Rob Sale on the offensive line recruiting. Um, I don't, you know, obviously we've had our <laughs> takes on that. and We just shared some of them when we were talking about the young man that's already uh, Enoch. But if we could go ahead and get, uh, one more offensive lineman in this class, I mean, that that give you three already wrapped up. That's that's pretty good stuff. Guys, any other takes on, on this before we uh, get uh, – we bring Ryan in to talk a little NCAA tournament? No, I don't, I don't have anything else. No, I'm good. I like West, that. You good that, on that? I like the offensive lineman as well. Um, yeah, man. Well, we'll take all the offensive yeah, yeah. linemen we can get. <laughs> yeah. All right, man, we're going to bring our buddy Ryan in now. We're going to talk a little NCAA tournament action. Florida Gators, obviously, man. Ryan, how you doing, buddy? Can't complain. How are you all? Oh, man, good, man. Good. To, we're just yeah, making good, it man. in the world, brother. <laughs> Is your bracket busted already? Oh, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it's taking it's taking some lumps right now. <laughs> good yeah, to see South about. Carolina. We already got two SEC teams out of the, out of the mix. I mean, and it – we just got done with dinner. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> All right, man. Well, 
you know, obviously we want to just focus in on the Gators. We want to talk about that bracket that we're in uh, there and um and the matchups we may be facing. Obviously, for those who haven't heard, Colorado beat Boise State, so we're going to be facing Colorado tomorrow around 4.30 or 5 or 5.45 or whenever they decide to tip us off, depending on how the action goes. Obviously, we're going in a man short now with the injury, um, you know, with the injury there. Yeah. What do you think this team is going to look like coming out the gate tomorrow, man, off on the heels of, of obviously a, a tough loss to Auburn, but a really good run. But first, no, you know what? Before I get to that, what was your take on the seeding? Did you think the seeding was fair, the number seven seed? Man, I tell you what, if, if you don't lose that game to Vandy, you're a six seed and you're looking way better right now than what you Absolutely. are at the moment. Because, I mean, if you beat this Colorado team, you're more than likely on to Marquette next. And Marquette is very good this year. Um, it's just disheartening. I figured we'd get a six seed, especially making it to the SEC championship. I mean, if we would have – I would say if we would have made it a closer game, I wonder if that impacted the seeding. But too little, too late, I guess. I, I think I think it's kind of a, a, a Florida State thing, too. You know, the committee looks at the injury as well and says, you know, obviously the banding loss hurt. Me and you talked about it on our Respect Our Rowdy show that we have done. And for y'all that haven't checked that out, me and Ryan did several episodes uh, prior to getting to this point and talked about what – Florida would need to do down the stretch. And and we talked about it over and over again. And obviously beating Vanderbilt wasn't even a – losing to Vanderbilt wasn't even a thought in our minds. Like that was like, oh, well, that's a given. That's a in the basket. But um, here we are. <laughs> obviously, you, you looked ahead, and then you made a great run in the tournament. Like, I mean, you just – you you obviously, you played Georgia tight, but you, you got the win, and you knew, you know, obviously we've played Georgia tight a bunch. But you beat Bama for the second time this season. Looked great doing it, scoring over 100 points once again. Uh, you know, you get that tough win versus A&M, and then you 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 let down against Auburn. Obviously, you get the injury there early in the game. That that takes a lot of wind out of your sails when you lose such a great interior presence like that. But um, and playing you know, three games in three nights and that yeah, well, I mean, the, yeah, 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 but Thanks. it 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 kills you. It absolutely does. Um. But, you know, you have to – You have to if you're going to be a championship team, that's the kind of stuff you got to do. That's why you've, you've conditioned all, all this time to get there. But what is, what is, it, what is Colorado going to bring to the fore tomorrow afternoon? Well, real quick, I just want to say one thing. 5-0 and o against Mike Watt. Perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> they Colorado got what they has- paid for. <laughs> yeah, uh, Colorado has three potential NBA uh, draft picks on their team. They're a really, really efficient three-point shooting team. Um, you have KJ Simpson, who's their he's their main guy. He's he's going to be the one that gets all the touches. Um, they're really good off off pick and rolls. So I expect them to really, really try to hammer it on us with the pick and roll. Um, there's one one specific matchup that I think is just awful right now and that's uh Tristan De Silva. He is a beast and I don't know if we'll be able to guard him or not. I think it really just comes down to if we can get Samuel or Richard on him. I don't know if Richard can handle him, but I think anytime that he's in the paint we need to try to switch off of him and get put a big on him and see how well they do with it. Um and then they have a center named Eddie Lampkin that mm-hmm. is a man among boys. I mean it, this would have been a really good game for Micah to have Micah right in the center of the paint. Just keep your arms up. Don't jump. Just man man the paint. That's all you needed to do. Um, they're, yeah. they're coming in averaging 79 points a game, uh, 37 rebounds a game. They're not a bad, not a bad rebounding team. Um, right now I've seen on all the betting lines and everything, we're one-and-a-half point favorites. That's I just tight, think it really man. Can, it is. It's really tight. They're they're a lot better than a, a ten seed. I'll say that. Well, and I, I think you know, and Vegas looks at everything. We know that, and I think that that loss of Micah just looms so so big that they can't mm-hmm. ignore it. I mean, you know, you lose that inside presence, like you said, and that they've got that big man inside that you know now you've got one less guy to defend him with. Um, 
the big question I think out of the last two games is uh and and you know I'll throw it I'll throw it at you. What what do you think's going on with Kyle? I don't know. I think I know they came out and said that it's not necessarily a disciplinary thing. It's just they're looking at the overall view of everything and the scope and saying, "Hey man, you're not being smart with the ball. You're not doing A and B." Um I think it just really comes down to Aberdeen's outplaying him and Aberdeen's being – he's being smarter with the basketball. Because, I mean, yeah. Cougar will play – he'll make one or two terrific plays and then you'll see two really bad plays and one awful play, one awful turnover, something like that. Um, I think this will be a really big game for Cougar or Aberdeen because one of them's going to have to step up and guard K.J. Simpson. Yeah. I mean, I – the one thing you say about Kugel is he, he he makes his free throws. I, I'll give him that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and we've we've seen us uh, not look pretty. So I don't want to put the the you know obviously the cart before the horse here, but say we we pull it out tomorrow. What's it looking like versus Marquette? Obviously, you said they're a very good. They're a very good club. What are they going to bring? And and that's just assuming they win as well. Obviously, you yeah. know they hadn't played yet. But let's just safely assume that they do. What are we looking at? I think it's a better matchup for us. Um, I'm just curious to see how well. Because Shaka is he's a defensive guy, so I, I fully expect him to come out and try to go against our weaknesses. And I, I think that he'll try to go in a matchup zone and see how we do with that. Because zones have killed us all year. I was going to say, we know how zone works. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to handle them. I don't. We make it look a lot harder than what it needs to be. Absolutely. Is that the as as you know you look at the bracket? To me, if we get over that, you you I thought we would handle Colorado, but now you're scaring me. It's vice versa. I was thinking Marquette would, of course, they will be the team. So, uh, as far as the ceiling, um, in my bracket, I have us in the final four, but. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't say that when I said I had it in the final eight, and, and I, I went full west. You you kept that one quiet I'm full, because I, I, I'm looking at that. Mar I'm thinking if we get past Marquette, then this man, yeah. So it hey. other than Marquette, who's the other team to beat in the in the uh, in the bracket? Let me the, let me load up our side of the bracket real quick. I I've just really been focusing on this matchup. This weekend, uh, I got you. I, I'm sorry. I got it right. No, here. you're good. I, well, I, had I had it because I was looking at it. Um, well, obviously, that's the Purdue break. Or no, 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 that's the Midwest. I'm sorry. Uh, Houston's obviously the number one seed in that. But I, to me, I thought the Midwest was the the easiest bracket. That's why I, I'm not too too much worried about Houston because I think the Big Twelve kind of been down this year, especially Kansas not being as good as they usually are, and Houston kind of mm -hmm. like almost ran away with that. So. I think if we meet Houston, to me, that's Marquette. And now that you put me on Colorado, to me, would be harder, harder than than going against Houston, even though their record looks well, ab absurd. I I think to me, we're going against a team that has three potential NBA draft picks versus Marquette, which may have one or two. There's a huge difference, and I think we match up better with Marquette. Um, but. I do, I do, guys. Say I like your confidence in in Florida's basketball team to pick them in your Final Four. That's uh, West, that's West has confidence in Florida to do everything. West has it going to the. It's playoffs. Out, it's, it's, it's the way they play defense at times, and and I forgot who's the guy that been tweeting out all uh, week. Florida's going to be a problem. And see, he's with me. If they if we get in, the, if yeah. we get in here, that's the same guy that said Mike White was one of the best hires in college oh, basketball. No. Well, we're not oh, talking about genius. what he said in the past. <laughs> we're just talking about what he said this year. So, so disregard he said that this year. He said that about Mike White at Georgia. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, I mean, here <laughs> too. You've also got a few other teams over there in our, our region. I think we, we got Duke. we got Duke, uh, Kentucky still in our region. Duke um, is beatable. You've got uh, North like, Carolina State. North Carolina State's gotten really hot towards the end of the season. Um, you know, it's you know, there's definitely some sleeper teams in there. Uh, you know, Colorado is a team. I think I think we all were hoping that Boise State would win because I thought you know I thought that would be a better matchup for us than than Colorado, especially without Micah in the middle. Um, in this game, it's you know, 
we, you know, and then two, we, we kind of split the neutral games we played without him. Uh, you know, we, we lost to, we beat Pitt and then we lost to, um, oh man, I can't remember the other team with us too, but we split the neutral games without Micah. So that's, you know, it's kind of like it's 50 50. What do you, what do you really think? What now? Virginia? Was it Virginia? Virginia. I think it was, I think, I think you're right. Virginia, we didn't Virginia. have Poland. Right. Maybe we didn't have Poland. Poland. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it could go either way, but our, you know, our guards are so good. Um, you know, that they give us a chance to win, you know, it's, it comes down to math. If you're scoring three and they're scoring two, you know, you can, you can at least make it a, <laughs> see, they I mean, obviously you, is, is, is our statistical guy. <laughs> who, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Three is more than two. <laughs> Ryan, who in, your, who in your opinion has to step up to replace a uh, big man in the middle? Like who's the guy that's going to have to, uh, Take cover. Mike, fill Micah's shoes. Yeah, who, who's going to have to cover that? And, and I, I know they've been kind of splitting minutes with uh, the trio, but like, who's going to like be that guy? Who do you think should be that guy? Who has to take that initiative and say, "Hey, I'm going to take up the slack. I'm going to. I know we're down uh, our guy, but I'm going to pick that up." I think it's going to be Condon. I mean, if you're going on the defensive end, I would say Ha. I mean, Ha. He does such a good job covering one through five. I mean, it's unreal how well he defends but condon i see i think mike is a big loss when it comes to the offensive rebound and just that paint presence but as far as total offense goes i feel like we can, we're a better scoring team when he's not on the floor because we have condon who can also drive by you whereas mike just kind of stands right there in the paint and gets tips um I, I just don't see us i don't see mike being that insurmountable of a loss to, for this game or for it's the just, year. It's, uh, it might be I, more I of agree. a mental thing than it is yeah. anything. Like, yeah, how, how do you respond to being, you know, to to being that man down? You know, you yeah. Know, the team it's good that they have. Yeah, it's good that they have this many days off as well to prepare and yeah, uh, and he has to come up. Yeah, bit. another a new rotation as far as how he's going to rotate guys in and out. And you know, the bench is probably going to get shorter anyway with uh, this being one and done. So um, I agree with yeah. you, though. I agree with everything you said. I, Ryan, I just want to say one thing real quick. Oh, oh no, sorry. Say it. No, you're good. Uh, Go ahead. I don't I don't see Duke being too much of a factor. I, I think that they lose. Oh, Duke always, weekend. you know, Duke, Duke, yeah. Coach Shashevsky ain't walking through those doors. Um, and even Over when he high. was, he was still choking before he got, got to the final four. Ryan, who's in your final four before we let you go? Oh gosh. This is uh it's uh -oh. gonna break my heart to say it, but I've got uh -oh. Kentucky. In, oh. Out of the South, Tennessee in the Midwest, oh, UConn, God. and North Carolina. I mean, Tennessee's I got just got such an easy road. They, they I got honestly, and it is, I got Tennessee in my Final Four as well. Yeah, I got I Tennessee mean, playing in the final against UConn. So oh I mean, God! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, just, and Tennessee. To be good. honest with you, like, if yeah, you're exactly right. They can score from everywhere. That's the thing is, and especially if Connect's hot, you're not beating them. Because everything he's throwing up, as soon as he gets across half court, it's going in. I got Florida um, versus North Carolina. I um, said that low. Man, take the, <laughs> take the glasses off. He, he don't know. Uh, he, he ain't never took the glasses off. He, he sleeps with them glasses on. You got uh, I got Florida losing, you, though. If, Oh, <laughs> what? Why did they just let us go that far? She's going to have us lose. You got to commit to the whole thing. <laughs> He's not. Uh, he's not. He worked himself into a shoot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He doesn't want to make us look too strong, brother. We got to come back next year for the rematch. Yeah. Um, but we he's do not have some. The story. <laughs> just a, a quick little little update. We do have some portal news. Um, uh oh. We are. Up. We are heavily attracted. Well, not heavily attracted. We are heavily oh, reaching out to a lot of uh, players. So we I've have, noticed a uh, few on on X the last few days. A lot of uh, I saw some guard a guard I can't remember his name. It's gonna kill me. I should have taken taken better notes knowing you were gonna be on tonight. I failed. Jacoby Gillespie. Yes, I sent thank you. I sent you him. Um, That's right. He is a dog. <laughs> is that the kid out of Western Carolina? Nope, he is out of Greenville, Tennessee. Went to school or he's transferred from Belmont. Belmont. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. He averages two steals per game. Um, I'm not sure about points as far as everything goes, but he is good. I, I've seen him play in high school. 
I've, I've just kind of watched him go his whole entire career. I was really hoping that he was going to hit the portal. Um, we have a big man, Sam Alexis, out of UT Chattanooga. Um, another guard, Deshaun Montgomery, out of Ma- uh, Mount St. Mary's. Amari Williams, out of Drexel. Uh, Jalen Counter, out of IUPUI. Man. So we're we're really getting into the portal, and I I think that we can land a couple of these guys. How many spots you think we're gonna have? I think that we're gonna have five, five or more. Um, it really really depends on if Clayton goes pro. How how hard this is gonna be for us next year? I hope they can convince him to stay. Yeah, I, we kind of talked about it. The, I've heard the they they they. they had some real talks about getting Clayton convinced to stay. That's we we talked about like how the portal is going to affect all the other sports because you know we mainly focused on football, but like basketball. Todd Golden has shown that you could build an absolute unit yeah. on the basketball court with a portal, especially when you've only got five guys on the court at a time. You know, you mm-hmm. get two or three really good solid pieces out of the portal. Mm-hmm. I could change your entire basketball team. Uh, you know, and, and we talked a little bit about it in baseball, but basketball seems to be really the place where you can really make a living in the portal, you know, as opposed to, you know, really, really hard recruiting high school basketball. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you get some guys that have played a little bit, albeit maybe they're Ivy league guys, maybe they're, you know, lower division guys, mid major programs, but you know, these guys can really ball, you know, and now they've got a chance to go play for big programs. And and I think that, that Todd golden has really kind of revealed the secret sauce um, to the rest of the world is this is how you get this is how you get to be really good at basketball really fast. Yeah, you can and and in the it's, portal now with, with like you're talking about, you have the ability to go out and get specialists at different things. Yep. A, a great rebounder, a great three point shooter, you know, a great distributor. You can absolutely pick out a guy just for his what he brings that one skill he brings. I'd like to bring in five good free throw shooters. <laughs> that would be fantastic. Five guys that just can all shoot seventy percent or more, and I'd be real comfortable. <laughs> uh, the portals, I mean, the portal in basketball is a lot easier. It's a lot quicker turnaround because I mean, yep. if you look how basketball typically translates, that's why Calipari, unfortunately, has had so much success because he has one and dones. I mean, it's a really, really youth friendly sport. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I don't buy the whole. Turnaround. Oh, well, Todd's got to start getting more recruits. He's got to start getting more recruits. Do you really? Probably I mean, would it be nice to have that to, one yeah. really good kid that yeah. can come in that's just a no-doubter? Absolutely. Yeah, if, he, if he can land one five-star, maybe a soccer. Yeah, that's really I mean, all you need. Yeah, one or two good core guys, and then you can build around them with guys that you've seen play basketball in college, like like uh, CJ was alluding to, like uh, the mid-levels. Uh, whether it's Belmont or uh, Davidson, I'm just throwing out schools. Like you can pull these guys now and say, okay, I've seen him play. He's a guy that can fit what I'm trying to get around this uh, top 10 guy if you but get yeah. this one. Yeah. And me and Ryan talked about this. If you can turn this run that you're having this year and the hype and the momentum that's come with it and say you go get the, boo- the Boozer Twins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I was about to say. Cough, cough, that, Boozer Twins. <laughs> if you get the Boozer Twins – and, and I'm not saying we are, I, but we're hot and heavy involved in them right now. We're in the thick of it. And if somehow you turn a little run that you've had, you know, here recently into to pulling those kids on top of those recruits we're talking about, then you're starting to really build a monster. Yeah, because what he showed to me this year is he can coach. Like, he he's a good coach. So And and, and that's what kids want to see, that, that they can be developing. And he's proven that he, he's very, very good at that. So, uh, and that's what kids want to be. They want to be developed. Yep. So he's just got to learn to keep that foot on the gas. That's the one yeah. thing that's that's a loop. <laughs> but he's he's learning it. He got better down the stretch. I mean, obviously the Vandy game, but something's got to happen with officiating in the SEC, man. Like it's just it's terrible. I, I hate uh, to be that. I'm not that guy. Like I understand. Like hey, play better. I understand that the refs are going to have a certain, you know, effect on a game. But at a certain point, man, hey, you got to make your shots. But there's been some games, the early Texas A&M game, I mean, just some that are like, what? The Ole Miss game where we just got embarrassed for whatever reason. That's basketball, Um, though. Sometimes the ball just don't Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's it's like baseball in a sense where, yeah. I was going to piggyback off you real quick, Wes. 
like you said with Golden, and you you showing him that he can develop. I mean, if you look at our free throw percentage from the beginning of the year to now, there's a huge development. Every time that we've showed a deficiency, he showed a way that we can improve on it. Yeah. Except zone zone management right now. <laughs> the zone is hard because you just have to really. There's really no secret to to fix it. You just have to shoot your way out of it. You have to make them respect mm-hmm. you, you shootings, and if you can't do it, if his ball's just not dropping, then what, you need what a, do you do? You need a guy in the middle that you need a dude in the middle that can <laughs> like when you knock down mid range shots. Yeah, you have to have a big that's also capable of passing the ball when he flashes towards the the free throw line. Unless you switch it up and put a guard there, um, but you need somebody to be able to flash in the middle that's able to kick out or drive or just a capable passer is how you beat zones. You, it's not mm-hmm. shooting because that's what that zone is, wants you to do. Uh, they want you to take those shots because those are high percentage shots. You want somebody to flash in the middle and be able to create from the middle of the paint. Um, and if you get that, some guys are good where you have the big to big. Like I'm not saying we're going to have a joker there, but if you have somebody that like Embiid or Joker – that capable of tight pass, like uh, uh, matter of fact, our boy, uh, um, uh, I, <laughs> no, no, from the championship years, uh, um, Noah, no, I couldn't, I don't know why I couldn't think of Noah's name, but Noah was a guy that could pass the ball as a big, very, very well. And you need somebody like that that's going to flash in the middle and create havoc, uh, whether he's kicking out to a three guy or he's doing big to big passing, and, and that's how you beat zones. Yeah, I think the only thing oh, you really well, worried about Jake with this, this Florida team is just the the way we play out of the fast break so much. You just trying to eliminate the, the turnovers. You know, there's some games this year we played we've just been a turnover hell um, because we try to play so fast, and you, you just you can't do that in these games in these situations. So if you can, I think that we have a really good chance if we could just find a way to limit the turnovers, maximize our possessions, come away with points. Uh, you know, more times than not, at least get to the line, you know, get the fouls, get to the line and shoot. Um, there's, there's just a lot of good stuff on this basketball team that I don't think we've seen in a long, long time. So, you know, I'm, I'm definitely excited to see where we go. I'm, I'm just glad to be actually able to watch the Gators play in the tournament again this year. This is like it feels like we haven't been in the tournament forever. I mean, I know it hasn't been that long, but it just feels that way. <laughs> yeah, and with a chance to actually win. <laughs> Uh, I feel like one of our main struggles with zone is we dribble too much. I mean, you have Pullen who's trying to dribble out, it, dribble into everything, and Clayton who's trying to dribble and set stuff up. I mean, to beat a zone, like what Wes was saying, you have to have a big man, but you also have to be really fluid with your ball movement. Look, you have to have guys just, coming off and making all I pray for All I pray for in this game is that we're not trying to have to inbound the ball with the lead with 30 seconds left to go because I might have a stroke. Watching these guys <laughs> try to inbound the ball. That that against, cost us the Vandy game. Yeah. Yeah. Against pressure. Like, we're going to have to practice something, man, because I can't watch this very much more. We just try to uh, get it in. That's it. We don't even that's what I'm make saying. a break to the, the ball. The getting it's it inbounds is the hardest part. And then Clayton trying to make a crazy pass with it. And it's just, oh, please, God. Ryan, man, thanks so much for coming on with us tonight, man, and breaking this all down. Um, hopefully we can have you on again because there will be more basketball to talk about. That's that's what we'll hope. Sweet but if sweet not, sweet. but if not, we'll, do, we'll bring you on to talk about portal news. All right. Thank you all for having me. And go Gators. Yes, sir, go baby. Gators, go Gators. Go Gators. Appreciate you. Oh, he gone. He gone. He out. <laughs> he gone. You gotta watch all right, guys. Team, we got more games on. Hopefully, hopefully we're talking we're talking about some W's after tomorrow. All right, CJ, you you waited your turn patiently. Waiting patiently. You we'll waited about. your turn patiently. Let's let's talk a little Gator baseball, sir. Uh, it's time for around the bases with CJ. I don't yeah, have an official. Round, I don't have an bases. official bring in there, but uh, yeah. This is your this is your show. Yeah. Um, Everybody like step off the ledge again. I, I feel like every time I do this, it's like it's like yeah, everybody's ready to just be like lemmings and just jump off the cliff. Um, <laughs> the midweek pitching is not good. I'm not going to tell you that it is. I, I don't have any advanced <laughs> metric to pull out of my rear end to tell you, hey man, they're they're really pitching good. If they would do this, you know, that, that it's it's not great. But again, you're looking at some guys that either 
A are freshmen or B are or have been here a while but haven't got a grasp on it anyway. That's why they're not in the starting rotation for the weekend. Man, uh it's just like a Jekyll and Hyde. In the midweek games, Florida just looks off. Um, then you get to these the weekend series, and they look just as good as ever. Uh, somebody, I think Kendall Rogers or somebody mentioned it. It's like, what, what are we going to do if Florida loses all their midweek games but win all their weekend series? <laughs> and you know, it, It's like, oh, man. Uh, but you, know, you beat Texas A&M in a, mid, in a weekend series, which is a really good win because Texas A&M – Hadn't lost up to that point. They were undefeated coming into the weekend. You've also got now what's looking like a better weekend series win over Miami as they go through this. They're getting much better. Um, they got a big ACC weekend uh, win in their series. So now let's, you know, th- now we're going to have to answer the question, okay, now we're going on the road, actually true on the road. You're going to LSU which is a tough place to win. Those people out there love college baseball. They're defending national champions. Um, and they've got some dudes. Uh, you, you talk about Thatcher Hurd that's on that team. Uh, you, you talk about uh, you've got Tommy Tommy White is still over there, and he's absolutely destroying the baseball. Uh, Gidry is their pitcher. He's a very good pitcher, very talented. Uh, the gentleman from uh, South Carolina. Uh, I, that, that transferred in. I want to. Say, I feel like his last name is Millsap, but I, I could be totally off base. Uh, but he was a guy that gave us a lot of fits last year when we played South Carolina. Um, so he he's definitely a guy to look out for. LSU is very good. LSU is eighteen and four. They've only lost four games all season, albeit a couple of those losses were to weird teams. I think they lost one to Xavier. They lost one to Stony Brook, and then their other two losses came to the. Mississippi State Bulldogs in last weekend series. So they dropped the series against Mississippi State. Um, LSU is, is is a hard nut to crack this year. Uh, they've got great offense. At times, their their pitching looks really good. And at times, their pitching looks really horrific. Uh, it's it's kind of like a tale of two halves. It's like, what are you, what are you getting with LSU? LSU is a team that they're definitely going to get up to play us because they always do. Um, this is one of the great rivalries, I think, in college baseball that doesn't get talked about enough. LSU and Florida is, you know, you're talking about two teams that have really been the class of SEC baseball um, for many years, over the last decade. Um, you're talking about two teams that are constantly in the mix, constantly in Omaha, uh, constantly in the national championship discussion. Of course, you have your other teams, Vanderbilt, Arkansas, South Carolina, uh, the Mississippi schools. So, you know, there's a, there's a, some really good teams over here. But LSU and Florida has become, you know, a really big rivalry. Um, you know, and when you're talking about teams that just absolutely at the top of the heap in baseball. In, in Florida, again, Florida has played so well in most of these weekend series. You have your games where everything doesn't look great. But Cade Fisher probably played his best game last Friday that he's played all season. He gave up five runs in one inning, but after that he shut it down. Like it wasn't like he, you know, kept getting his, you know, getting get beat up. And I think it, that Kevin O'Sullivan just had enough and just said, "You're going to go out there and you're either going to get embarrassed or you're going to figure this out." And and for right now, it looks like he, he's figured it out. Um, Brandon Neely had his great performance. Everybody was kind of worried about Brandon Neely. He had not, you know, shown that he was the elite closer that he had been, but he had a three inning close, you know. Just a great performance by him. A guy that, again, I feel like if, you know, I still feel like he should be a pitcher in the starting rotation for Florida. I feel like Brandon Neely had shown that he could do that. Um, you know, he's a great closer, but I just, I, I would love to see him get another chance in the starting rotation. And the way it's going for um, McNelly, maybe he gets that shot. Uh, excuse me, not McNelly, but uh, Peterson. You know, Liam Peterson is going to be a guy who's probably going to be a great fresh you're going to be a great pitcher he's probably going to be a great pitcher towards the end of this year but he's just got some growing up to do um it's nothing unusual when you're talking about freshmen that they're you know coming from a level where they played in high school and pretty much dominate everybody that they play because they're that much better then you get to sec level baseball and you're you're seeing some of the best of the best when it, when we talk about the the difference in baseball or we talk about the difference in the SEC and football 
everybody's like, okay, the SEC is the most dominant football conference. When it comes to baseball, you can't even argue that anybody else is close. The SEC occupies the top 10 frequently every year. You're producing the best baseball players. So when you come in as a true freshman or a redshirt freshman, and now you've got to pitch to SEC baseball players, guys that are major league baseball prospects, it's a it's a culture shock. It's a change. You've got to learn. Um, and Kevin O'Sullivan has shown multiple times that he can develop these guys. It looks kind of rough to start with, but they figure it out in the end. I can remember – Early on in 2022, Brandon Sproat Brandon looked pretty rough Like early on. We played that first series against LSU at home, and Brandon Sproat was – he got destroyed against LSU. And we were thinking, oh, my gosh, this guy, he, he can't do it. And by the end of the season, he's a guy that's one of the best players. He's one of your weekend guys. He's almost to the point where the next year he was your ace. He was your Friday night pitcher. And he was picked up, drafted by the New York Mets. Also, again, then the next year, drafted again by the New York Mets. That's where he's at now. And when it started, it was kind of rocky. So you've got to give these time, these guys time to grow and adjust. Um, they're not bad pitchers. I, I see that thrown around a lot. As all these guys are just bad, and they're always going to be bad, and they can't get better, which just isn't true especially with guys that we've seen pitch and we know can pitch well. You know, they've, they've got a lot more good than bad on film. So, you know, to, to say that, hey, this guy's just bad and he's always going to be bad just isn't the case. We have got to be a little more patient. And I, I'm going to come out and say this, too. If Florida doesn't make the College World Series, if we don't play in it, eh, Oh, well, I mean, I know you hate to say that because you've got guys that can swing the bat like Caglione and, and Shelton, just absolutely dominant players. But we we were one game away from a national championship last year. And at some point, you've got to rebuild. You've got to have a year where you've got to refocus everything. I think Florida gets it right by the end of the year, and we're talking about a team that can possibly go to Omaha, but definitely a team that makes the tournament. Um and I don't, and I think they can win a few games in the tournament. And like I said, Omaha is not out of the question when you have a team that can swing the bat like Florida. So you've got to kind of tone back some expectations. And, you know, I make jokes all the time about we're going to win a national championship. I say that every year with Florida baseball because it legitimately is a team that has produced talent that could do it every year. But we've, we've got to really calm down about this. And I understand the midweek series are – the midweek series and we haven't won a lot of those. I think we're two and five in the midweek, which isn't, isn't great, but it's just one of those things where we've got to kind of lessen our overreactions and just kind of let's let it sit and let's figure it out. Give it another month um, and see where we're at then. Let's see if these guys progress. Can they pitch better or are they are what, you know, are they what they are? I mean, is, is it not going to get better? We don't know. It's still too early for us to tell. Uh, I think this really true road game with LSU, when you play these guys, where you play guys like Tommy White who can swing the bat, or you play guys like Zeb or those guys that they have that are very good baseball players, it's going to tell you a lot about this Florida baseball team going forward. So I, I really I'm curious to see how we do in this. If we find a way, find a way to win this series, if we go into LSU, into Baton Rouge, and we we take two games, then I think all our goals are still in front of us because if you can go into LSU and win that series, you've, you've proven that you can, you can hang with just about anybody um, on the right night. Is there anything you would do differently as far as midweek since there's been since uh, a, a sort of a struggle there? Is there anything that you would switch up or try differently? Here's the thing about the midweek series. It's, you you can't really put your best guys out there because the you need them is for the rotation. You you need them for the weekend. Um, you know maybe you see Fisher Jamison get a start. Uh, Slater got the start. You know Phil Pot, uh, Hartzog. You know some of these guys maybe Purnell maybe gets a start. But I it's just one of those things where you've only got so many pitchers. Yeah. And you've just McNally, you've got to figure him out. Um, Liam Peterson, you got to figure out what you're doing with him. 
Um, and, and you've only got so many arms. It's not like we can say, okay, we're going to start Jack Caglione at pitcher on a Tuesday or Wednesday yeah. night. You just You just can't do that. Um, you, you know, you can't start Cade Fisher on a Tuesday or Wednesday night. I, I even, even if you're not going to start Cade anymore, even if they decided, Hey, we're not starting Cade anymore. He's too valuable to the weekend rotation in the bullpen. So I, it, it comes down to, I think, and, and I think Kevin O'Sullivan said it, guys have just got to play better. You've just got to pitch better because, you know, these guys have pitched a lot. They pitched a ton. They played travel ball. They played fall ball. They played spring ball. They played summer ball. They just play all over all year long. They're playing baseball. So these guys know what they need to do. I, I don't know if it's a mental thing, um, which is like, you know, one of the things about baseball is a lot of it is mental. Um, so you've got to be able to go. And, and we saw it with, with Neely. Neely got smacked around a couple of times, but then he comes out and he shuts it down like he'd never had a bad game in his life especially the pitcher, you have to have the mindset of, um, you know, hey, man, I just gave up a grand slam for her on, you know, home or whatever. Must have been something wrong with the ball because it, no, it, I know it's not me. Didn't happen. They can't hit my stuff. They, Didn't that's, happen. That's, that's how you have, to, you have to have that approach. Like a football and that's analogy. You have to be like a, de- a defensive back. Okay, he, he caught that. Never so happened. Let's go back. Yep. Right. You know, the quarterback <laughs> throws an interception. He's something wrong with the football. I'm going to keep throwing it. Never happened. Yeah. You know, it's, that's, <laughs> that's how you have to look at it. If you can't do that, it's going to be really difficult for you. And that's the difference when you're talking about a mindset of a freshman as opposed to a battle-tested senior. Can a, a senior can overcome that? You know, you worry about your freshman. They've got to show that mindset. If you can't, if you can't get beat up on a on a Tuesday and Wednesday night and bounce back from it and play again well the next week, if you can't shake that, you're never going to make it as a weekend pitcher. You're never going to do it. And to your you point, have, you have you to tell have me if I'm right about this. I think it's like when when you're a freshman coming in, you've had nothing but success. Nobody can hit right. you in high school. So right. that's something you're used to. So when you get to the University of Florida and you're playing and you're like, I mean, something's wrong. Like why that? And so to speak to your mentality part as far as a freshman, that's what they're going through. Like they've been dominant 20 and probably one, 15 and one, whatever. 0.99 ERA, about, and then they get beat around. Lower. So, yeah, you're talking lower. <laughs> you're talking guys with like 0. 0.5, 0. 0.4 yeah. ERAs coming out of high school. Like nobody's been able to hit them. If they gave up a hit, it was an off night for them. It, it's different. You talk about a guy like uh, like last year with Philip Abner. Philip Abner is a good pitcher, uh, but people didn't want to see him start. He wasn't our best pitcher in the bullpen. I loved Phil, but he was a great. He was a good pitcher. But it wasn't like he was a great, great pitcher. I mean, he's playing in the MLB now. He got drafted by the Diamondbacks. He's a good player. But in high school, he was next level. In high school, he was a .4 ERA pitcher, which is insane. That means ain't nobody hitting you. So you get to the next level, you've got to be able to be able to take some take some crap, eat humble pie for a little while, and figure it out. You're talking about the college game, and it's the same thing with the minors. You know, you got guys in in, in uh, high school that you know all they threw was heat. You know, because in high school, if you can throw ninety two miles an hour, you are buzzing it. You know, you guys can't hit it. Now you've got to develop some more breaking ball stuff. You've got to get the fastball faster if you can't. You, you you know, so you you're talking about learning new pitches. You've got to learn some new tricks, whether it's the slider or your changeup or your curveball. You've got to figure that out and find a pitch that you really like, like your go-to pitch that isn't a four-seamer, you know, right up the gut where it's like, here, come get it, because they're going to hit that all day long in the SEC. So you've really got to work and break, get your breaking ball stuff um, to some swing and miss pitches, um, and that's where they're really going to learn to do that is right now in college and then in the minors is where you really start to get that handle on it. So right now you're watching guys that, trying to throw uh, the breaking ball and they've got to learn their breaking ball. They've got to find something that really works. So I think that, I, I think that Florida has a lot of good stuff in the future. Um, and I think that that's the main thing we need to take away from this. These guys are talented pitchers. Um, I think that the only thing I will say about Florida, I want us to do a better job in the portal and this off season at getting some pitchers, um, which is there. Which, yeah. which is hard because the one guy we did get that we thought we were going to rely on, he got drafted. And, and I think that, too, is a, 
you just have to deal with that in baseball. You deal with it in recruiting in baseball because you can get all world baseball players committed, ready to come to Florida. Guy like Andrew McCutcheon committed to Florida, didn't go to Florida, went to play Major League Baseball. You miss out on a guy like that. You have to deal with it. So I think that you're just going to have to watch these guys grow and kind of take the lumps early on. And, and I think by we as we get into the warmer months, I think the guys will get better. I agree. I mean, and we've all three of us obviously are Braves fans. We saw a team that played, and obviously college has a slightly different, but baseball is baseball. Teams get streaky. If you get hot at the right time, there's no doubt that Florida has the talent on the team. You've covered that endlessly. They have the team to compete with any team in the country. I think we'll see that this weekend. We saw it last weekend, um, especially in a, in a, in a three-game series. So you get hot at the right time and get in a rhythm, you know, it all that changes real fast. That's why I don't I don't even care what they're doing right now. I, I'm one of those that doesn't really pay attention to that. If they're still pitching this bad in a month and a half, then obviously that's that's a that's an issue. But guess what? If it, like CJ said, if that's what it is. It's it's a rebuild. It, you're, then you know what you reload next year and you go again. But it's not the end of the world if that happens. You were one game away from the winning the College World Series a year ago. There's a lot of teams <laughs> in this country that would trade with Florida in a heartbeat. Would, if, uh, that's what almost it, uh, almost all of them except you look at look at Georgia. 10. Georgia's got Georgia's got Charlie Condon, who's like one of the best prospects in baseball, Golden he, Spikes guy. As of this Georgia's week, still, the number one ranked kid in the the number one rated draft kid. And Georgia still can't consistently win. I, I mean, it lost to Kentucky. It, it's baseball. It's it's a it, baseball is the biggest team sport in the world. One guy cannot win a baseball game. It just doesn't happen. Nope. And you when know, you're going you don't cold, care if you got Jack cold. Caglione coming out. I don't care if you got you know Shelton. Those are great players, but in baseball, one guy can't win it all for you. Uh, it's gonna be it's gonna have to be the sum of its of its parts. And like yeah, and when and when you get cold, you get cold. It just it yeah. happens. All right, guys, that's gonna wrap it up, man. As always, uh, you know we covered a lot of stuff tonight, and I hope I hope a lot of y'all stuck it out with us. I'm sure some didn't. I know some of y'all just. Come for the football content and whatnot, and that's fine. If if those first 20, 30 minutes of the show was all you came for and you're not hearing this, we missed you, and hopefully next time you listen a little longer, but we appreciate you tuning in regardless. I mean, we're just trying to bring a little bit of content for everything. Not everybody out there, you know, covering the whole spectrum. And, we're, you know, right now in the slow months of football, we want to pay a little bit of uh, acknowledgement to those other sports because – Hey, they're winning, man. It's fun. It's fun to watch teams win. That's why we can get. That's before why we, we complain about the baseball team when they're not winning. What are we forgetting? <laughs> we forget. Congratulations to the Florida Gator Hockey Club winning yes. the championship. Hockey team out here doing big things. Congrats Representing to those guys on the ice. That's what I'm talking about, baby. The Florida Gators <laughs> out here on the ice. They took they took notes from the other Florida hockey teams. Icy Gators winning baby that's that's what i'm talking about i love Jim gators are doing their thing i mean <laughs> come on man all right guys well, team's good. good yeah as girl. always i mean goodness gracious women basketball teams in the wnit or whatever that is recruiting uh, well kelly ray finley's yeah. doing a good job recruiting absolutely man all right, guys, that's going to do it, man. We appreciate you all. Uh, CJ, what do you got to add for the folks? No, Just thank you guys so much. Uh, check out the Twitter. Check out the Facebook. Subscribe, comment, like, do everything, all the stuff. Jump in the chats with us. Uh, follow us for the news. Uh, ask us questions. If you want to ask us questions, message us. Tag us in things. Uh, like I said, just check out all the things that we're doing. Check out our friends at Alma Mater. They just dropped the uh, Florida football spring training hoodie. With the uh, the beautiful Florida Gators uh, script that we've kind of adopted, that's Florida with the football behind it, looks really cool. Uh, so check them out. Use our link. Those are our friends. Uh, they're making all kinds of great gear, and it benefits the NIL athletes. Also, speaking of NIL, use our code with Florida Victorious. Use code Decisions. Uh, check those guys out. Help the Gator athletes. Uh, help our, our you know our guys that, and girls that entertain us that do these sports. Uh, you know, get us back to where we want to be. Uh, really come together as a fan base you know, we have a power to change things. So uh, invest in that. 
Also, too, like I always say, those the, it's not going to be for nothing. You're not just going to have a, you know, drop some money and forget about it. Uh, the Florida Victorious program does do things for its members, uh, especially with football season coming up, uh, baseball season. They're going to do tailgates and signings and things like that. that They've they're got gonna some email big you stuff planned for the spring game. I, right. I, so just keep up with that. They have things for the for their members. So just keep that in mind that they, they do stuff for you as well. It's not just a nameless, faceless organization that takes your money like a TV preacher and never gives you anything in return. So <laughs> just <laughs> you guys just keep giving to them, help us out, help our Gator athletes. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Mighty, mighty. The, 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 the righteous Florida victorious. <laughs> <laughs> Take us home, Wes. Yeah, as always, appreciate you guys for following us. Uh, thank you for guys for tuning in last week. Again, a uh, big shout out to Zach for joining us last week, and a big shout out tonight for Ryan for coming on and talking basketball with us as well. Um, hopefully, we can talk to Ryan next week about what we have to do to uh, get to the final four, which means we'll be in the Sweet 16, hopefully, the eight. So, hopefully, that comes to fruition, and you never know, we could be a Cinderella team. I mean, right. why not us? Uh, that's the way we have to have, that's the mentality we Surviving have to have. Advanced, so. baby. Exactly. You say Why right, not CJ. Florida? As always, go Gators. Go Gators, baby. Go <laughs> Gators, Colorado. baby. Make sure you check out our pod of the people, as always, this Sunday, guys. Be easy. Take care. Have a great weekend. Peace.